So first of all, I don't want to make this too much of a presentation. I want us to think together about some of these topics. I think today, all day, we've kind of covered a bit of the challenges. Like all morning, it's about, okay, we have to fix this. We have to fix that. This is what we need to do, and users have to do this, right? So you already have some of that, a feel for some of that. What I want to do in the next half hour, 40 minutes, is start thinking about how we as a community think, think about deploying OpenStack. What are vendors doing as, a, as, as people who are making products and solutions? What's the current state of the art? And where I want to take this towards, if you will, is really have people start thinking about where are things going, both in terms of OpenStack as a, as a community, products, and how it's being deployed. Are we doing the right thing? And I want to do this in the context of some of the underlying changes that are, that are happening to OpenStack as we speak. And I'm specifically referring to things like the new governance model that's coming to place, also called the Big Tent. I want to call out some of the ways how plugins are going to be managed in the future. right? And I, I think as users, as people deploying OpenStack, these are things that we want to think about. And so I've, I've, I've called this out kind of as a, I've, I've called it micro-infrastructure. But these days, the concept of mu as a, as, a, as a term, it's rapidly becoming a four-letter word, if you will. Because everyone wants to be a micro-something, microservices, micro, it's almost like, you know, back in the dot-com days where every, used to put an E in front of everything, right? The same kind of thing. Now everyone wants to put a mu in front of everything. That said, let's, a little bit about me and why I'm, you know, some of the, my background that I'm bringing to the, the talk here. So I've been at Red Hat a few years, work with Red Hat strategic partners around how do we build solutions together and take it to market, specifically focused on cloud solutions. And over the last few years, last two or three years, been working with a number of major vendors across the ecosystem. And as, you know, as, as, in that role, I've been somewhat fortunate to work on some fairly major initiatives going across NFV. One of the things I find somewhat, I found somewhat enjoyable and also at the same time somewhat humbling was this workshop series that we did together with Intel where we launched, we, had, we built this essentially an on-ramp to OpenStack where we took users, typically cloud architects, who are deploying a cloud infrastructure from little to no knowledge about OpenStack through a four-hour workshop where we got them started with the ground level knowledge. How do you deploy, what is OpenStack to begin with? How do you deploy it? And how do you use it? And how do they get the users to use it, right? And it's just fascinating to think about the kinds of questions that we got running these workshops. So it, it, we had a few dozen workshops worldwide, typically anywhere from 25 to in some cases in Europe and, and Asia, we got about 75, 80 people per workshop, typically enterprise customers, right? And I, I have these fascinating anecdotes from some of these workshops. My favorite anecdote was the one in, in, in Milan, where we had this workshop going on, and next door to the workshop was actually Intimissimi that were launching their new fall lineup for their new lingerie line. Middle of the OpenStack workshop, we had a bunch of folks who who, wanted to, who needed to go to the other room, a bunch of models and people in the fashion business, walk into the OpenStack workshop, and in their defense, they managed to survive about 20, 25 minutes of listening to Nova and Neutron <laughs> and Lance before they realized, I think we're in the wrong room. And I, 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 I swear, I, I'm pretty sure that there were some folks who were supposed to go to the OpenStack workshop who went into the Intimissimi workshop and didn't ever come back out of there, <laughs> right? But that's, that's a funny, funny story from that. So key points I want to emphasize is when you start looking at OpenStack and when we deal with customers, for example, deploying OpenStack in production, typically most of them start with some sort of a proof of concept, maybe a pilot, depending on how functionally complete you want to make it. Typically starts with a few nodes, starts with you know, a basic um, deployment, using some of the common deployment tools out there, try and understand what sorts of issues you encounter. A handful of compute nodes, a few controllers, make sure it's highly available, some, some sort of a storage platform, 
and walk, walk through a bunch of use cases. But keep in mind that over the last year and a half to two years, I think a lot of customers that we dealt with have come to realize that the kinds of issues that you encounter in a pilot is not necessarily the same sort of issues that you would encounter at scale, especially looking at deploying OpenStack at scale across a large enterprise, across potentially a number of use cases, a number of groups, and especially as you start scaling into much larger degrees, the sorts of issues, the sorts of end user questions, the challenges that come up tend to be a little bit different. So the first thing I want all of you to think about, or all of us to think about, is how do we, how do we bring people up to speed with understanding what, how do you respond to these sorts of issues when they happen? How can you use a small pilot with a handful of nodes and think about, you know, is that really preparing you for, for scale? I think as a community, we've all kind of learned as we go along. But these are areas where I think we, especially as vendors, distribution vendors, product vendors, we, we have an obligation to do more best practices sharing. Try and think about some of the challenges that we've encountered and addressed when taking OpenStack at scale and sharing more, more of that knowledge in the form of best practices and specifically in the form of integrated solutions, coming to the topic of my talk here, which is where, where are integrated solutions going? So when you look at things like deployment uh, best practices today and operational best practices, it, there, there's a lot of knowledge that has been built up leveraging the best current practices around how do you deploy to hardware, whether it's compute, whether it's networking, whether it is how do you orchestrate applications on top of that, and how do you tie it into use cases. And so when you look at typical enterprise deployment use cases, OpenStack is just one piece of the puzzle, right? It's not, there's typically something running on top of it. It's being tailored to some set of use cases. It's the same when you look at things like uh, telco use cases with NFE. There's typically a fairly complex uh, NFE stack with specific requirements, specific use cases. In the case of uh, uh, the NFE deployment that I did with Cloud NFE, that was actually the first officially approved NFE POC uh, by the Etsy group, right? And as part of that, there's multiple vendors that put, put together a stack, and then we tailor it to different use cases, showcasing why that stack works well for that NFE use case. But most of these are fairly complex, and the the, the real value that we provide as a community is how do we provide some best practices from these use cases and make it easier for the next set of use cases to build on top of, top of what's already come, happened before. But these sorts of best practices and solution uh, packaging focused on just OpenStack and the components that run on top of OpenStack is just part of the problem. There are numerous aspects to deal with when you take these, to, uh, these solutions to production in the real world. And to call out a few with some of the partners I've been working with over the last few months, when you look at uh, typical production class, production scale hardware, keep in mind that this, the hardware, as much as we talk about just abstracting away the hardware, it is not something that remains static. There's numerous moving parts just in the hardware everything from the firmware to the NIC cards to the stor storage elements to uh, you, you name it. Not to mention all of the other things that happen in the enterprise behind the scenes that feed into that platform, right? It's the same when you look in, at some of the use cases that are built on top of OpenStack. In fact, even when you look at just OpenStack, you look at some of the, the projects that have started to become more mature over the last few months, Sahara. Uh, which, which Hadoop distribution do you use? And what, is the, what are the implications or what are the differences between the different choices out there? You look at Trove, you, you can have absolutely different database models, have a nice little API, but different databases have different implications. When you look at, uh, the previous talk was on Docker and, and deploying Docker on top of OpenStack. There are a number of ways to do this, right? Take Kubernetes. You can deploy Kubernetes via heat Kubernetes templates. You can deploy it via Magnum or use it via Magnum. You can deploy it via Murano. There's a number of ways to do that. Now, none of this is bad, right? 
as an open source community, we are all used to this over the last two decades, two and a half, three decades, right? You look at Linux, there's always been lots of choices. You look at any major open source project, there's always been lots of choices. So that in itself is not a problem. I think, I, I'm, honestly, this is actually part of what makes open source, the open source community and uh, projects like OpenStack more valuable to customers in, th in that there are choices. It's really how do you minimize the risk behind the choices you make. And so uh, for, for a lot of customers that I talk to and the Red Hat teams that, that we talk to as, as, as a company, a lot of them are looking to minimize the risk and make sure that when they make choices, they're making the right choice, right? They're not getting stuck in something that's going to be a dead end. Because if, if they do, it's not fatal. They can still move to other choices, but it's going to cost them a bit more. So really, the, the key challenge that a lot of our customers are encountering is how do you minimize the risk behind making some of these choices? So. With OpenStack, more so than uh, a lot of other open source projects. Uh, by the way, I see a, a few of you snickering. I'm sure you've had to troubleshoot Neutron in the middle of the night, right? I haven't had much sleep in the last week. It, it, and that's just the nature of us. And by the way, someone was very active in Neutron. I don't want to pick on you. I actually love Neutron myself. It's, it's amazing for what it brings to the table. But if you've ever had to troubleshoot things like open vSwitch flows in the middle of the night, you know what I'm talking about. This is, this is a real perception that not people new to OpenStack, but people who have just gotten familiar with OpenStack try doing a proof of concept, a pilot. They look at, hey, this didn't work, so I let me go figure out why it didn't work so I can go back and start um, getting more experience with it. A fairly common perception is that when things break, it is hard to troubleshoot. It is complex. The state of tooling around OpenStack, it has gotten a lot better, but there is still a long ways to go, right? So all of that said, where, where, are, where are some of the solutions in, in all of this? And this is really coming to the essence of my talk, which is how do, you, how do we as a community try and build better solutions? And how do the solutions need to evolve? So let's take a quick survey of some of the solutions out there. This is something that was just launched maybe a month ago. It's uh, the FlexPod. Similar, if, for those of you who use FlexPod and other, uh, for other solutions like FlexPod for VMware or FlexPod for Citrix, now there's a FlexPod for uh, RHEL OpenStack platform that we've collaborated with NetApp and Cisco on. Similarly, and, and by the way, the intent with solutions like FlexPod is that this takes together some of the hardware, software, and management components, puts them together so that a customer that decides to implement OpenStack picks predefined, well-known, tested configurations of hardware and software, go through a very simple checklist of the key steps that they need to do to configure it for their environment, such as providing the IP addresses, perhaps a little bit of node discovery, which to kick off the, um, the installation process. And then within a matter of, uh, say, a few minutes, a few hours perhaps, in this case, we've done it in the lab in less than an hour, right, for a fairly complex environment. They have an OpenStack environment up and running. There are well-defined processes that we put in place through, uh, through the infrastructure behind FlexPod to help customers manage this, operate this environment in production and at scale through a combination of various hardware platforms ranging from, in this case, Cisco UCS hardware to uh, NetApp, both SAN and, and uh, NAS gear, as well as uh, Cisco networking with various plugins. And how do you make all of this fairly streamlined and something that all of the vendors can stand behind and support where we, we know the configurations, we have this working in our labs, and when you do run into issues, we typically troubleshooted this before. We know what, exactly what the cause is and what the fix is. And you know, in the lab, you can, we can toss out numbers. Like all this morning, a lot of folks are talking about how you do this quickly. Yeah, we've all done that. We've, we've kind of gotten past that. Now it's about how do you do this, not just with the software, but even on the hardware. And I'm specifically looking at the hardware side of things right now. 
And there's a, the, a number of solutions like this on the market. I call that FlexPod. Similarly, Red Hat is a solution with Dell, um, around the same, providing Dell hardware with REL OpenStack platform. Similarly, there's a solution that we're coming out with. There have been solutions in the past with Cisco and UCS. We continue to have more integrated infrastructures coming out. The solutions with Lenovo, the solutions with Fujitsu, uh, with HP, na name it, right? So that's part of what Red Hat brings to the table is the ecosystem, right? We, we work across an ecosystem of vendors. But then, then again, a lot of customers look at this and they go, that's all great, but my needs are different. And indulge me for a few seconds here, right? So how many of you guys in the room either own a car or have ever owned a car? Uh, guessing a good number. How many of you actually went into a showroom and walked out with a car and then you know, used it as opposed to building the car from scratch? Well, I'm gonna pick the fuel injector from this vendor. I'm gonna pick the you know, transmission from this vendor. I'm gonna pick the, um, I don't know, the power steering from this vendor pick all of the piece parts, build it together, and hope that it all works, and it remains functional and works you know, for the next, for the duration or the life cycle of the, when you own the car. All right, I'm guessing not too many. There's probably a couple in this row, I'm, I'm sure. But that said, when you step back and look at what we do in IT, right? Especially in, in, when, when we're working with the leading edge of technologies, we all have a penchant because we've all got that background to learn more. We all want to go about building things from scratch because that's kind of how we learn. If you, if you really want to know how a, a, a car works and an, an engine works, you got to build it. I take in classes in automobile engineering, right? That's one way you really know how things work. So when things break, you know how to fix it. But in reality, most of us today, when we look about deploying a cloud infrastructure, there's typically someone uh, that's looking to use it for a bigger purpose. Typically, many of us work in IT organizations where we have uh, some use cases that are pushing for having a cloud infrastructure in place. So if that was the case, do you really have the liberty? Do you have the time? and you have the resources and skills to build it yourself, right? And so this is kind of where I think we need to step back and evaluate how much are you saving by customizing a complex environment like OpenStack to the nth degree. And not to say it can't be done, it absolutely can be done. In fact, you'll find a number of successful deployments out there which are highly custom. But in our experience, having done OpenStack at scale for a number of customers, the more you customize it, the more it tends to diverge from the mainstream, the more time and effort and resources and cost it's going to take to keep that up and running at scale. Right? And so really the customization, if you will, is the enemy of uh, of scale in, in, in some respects. So I think we all agree. So the key point I want to come back to when I take this, bring this back to the state of solutions today is I'm not saying don't customize. Absolutely, you know, once you've understood OpenStack, feel free to do so. But please, please, please start with something where you know a, a baseline that you know works. If you're going to insert a Pringles can to connect up two tubes, just make sure at some point those two tubes actually talk to each other. Don't go about putting in a network, a neutron plug-in on, on top of an environment which never worked before. Okay, a neutron plug-in, if it's certified, great, maybe it'll work. But then if you go tune it with, with, with another plug-in that does something else, please, please, Try and work with a baseline that you know worked, hopefully has a few vendors that have certified the environment, have tested the environment, either upstream or in the downstream product. And then once you've got that baseline environment working, once you understand when things break, how to go about troubleshooting, what caused that break, 
then you can customize. And the way I, I, I like to characterize this is if you look at a simple graph with two axes, right? And the, on the x-axis is your, the skills that you have, whether it's your own skills, whether it's the skills that you have at your disposal in your company, or skills that you're willing to pay for, right? There's lots of consulting firms out there with really deep expertise around OpenStack. And on the y-axis, you have the amount of customization you're looking to do. Always make sure that the amount of customizations and tuning and special configurations you're, you're looking to do are in line with the amount of skills that you have either in-house or willing to pay for. The moment you start tuning this and coming into weird configs that you're not either willing to pay for the support or you don't have the skills in-house, then you're asking for trouble, right? And so the, when, you look at, when you come back and look at the solutions like FlexPod, like the Cisco UCS integrated infrastructure, like the uh, Dell solutions, like the uh, uh, Fujitsu solutions, all of these tend to take well-defined configs in, you know, as, as a baseline. On behalf of, of customers, what we are doing as vendors is picking a set of known hardware configurations Yes, it may, not be, it may not be exactly the config that everyone uses, but the vast majority of customers that have deployed OpenStack, well, we've seen them that this config meets most of their needs. It's roughly in line with the cost models that these customers are looking for. It's not perfect, but it's close enough, and we think that this has the best level of integration the best feature set that we think is, is, is required for production, right? And so we've kind of tailored it a little bit for you. But then the last, the last mile, if you will, is really up to uh, cloud architects. It's really up to consultants who are working with customers to design and deploy these solutions to leverage these best practices, leverage these foundational um, elements that we put together and not not take custom, not get into uh, too much, too deep water by going way off the configurations. So let me come back to the key thing which I'd like to get people thinking about uh, to a certain degree. There's a few things happening within the OpenStack community over the last few months. And I think all of these are good things And when you step back and you look at why these are being done. Uh, some of you may, may, have, may be familiar with the new governance model that's going into OpenStack, starting with the Liberty Cycle. Uh, it's commonly called the Big Tent. And the concept there is that historically, um, there's been a lot of work within the OpenStack uh, technical co uh, communities, technical committees, to try and decide what becomes an incubated project and then what becomes integrated. Certainly, there's a set of core projects, if you will. You know, you've got Nova, you've got Neutron, you've got Keystone, the core projects. But then there's all these other projects clamoring for attention. You've got Morano, you've got uh, Sahara, you've got uh, Congress, you've got literally a ton of, ton of projects. And so the, the governance model that's being moved to, starting with the Liberty Cycle, is really around moving to a model where each of these projects can start self-classifying themselves as OpenStack or not. And what that means is that uh, through, a, through a, a process process that hopefully people have given some thought to, which I think they have, there will be a, a system of tags, a system of um, uh, a, a nomenclature, if you will, by which projects can then self-identify whether, whether they meet those tags or, or characteristics or not. And so what that means is that over the next uh, few cycles, at least the next couple of cycles, I think the expectation is that there will be a lot more projects coming on board as OpenStack projects in some form, but then each of those OpenStack projects have some attributes associated with them, some tags that says, okay, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna be OpenStack and I'm going to support upgrades from this cycle to the next, and the third tag would say, I'm going to be releasing a new, uh, a new update every month as opposed to six months, right? And, the, and right now, I think the general intent is that every six months or so, which is currently the cycle that OpenStack's been following, there will be some sort of a uh, bringing together of the different projects potentially. 
And ultimately, I think it, it really puts a greater on, uh, onus on the distribution vendors to figure out which ones are more mature for mainstream use and to package things together in such a fashion that it can be consumed. Right? So that sort of a governance model is happening as we speak, in the, starting with the liberty cycle. Another example of uh, what I consider a fairly important change uh, is when you look at some key projects, such as Neutron, uh, what's been happening is that um, there's been a lot of complexity with third-party plugins that need to uh, integrate with Neutron using the Neutron mo models, whether it's ML2, increasingly ML3 as well for layer three plugins. And there's been a, a, it's been somewhat challenging to stay up to speed with keeping Neutron moving forward while at the same time bringing along all of these plugins and testing them all in, in kind of a trunk fashion. And so uh, what's gonna happen with the Liberty Cycle again is that, in fact, it's already started with the Kilo Cycle moving into the Liberty Cycle, is that a lot of the third-party plugins are gonna be taken out of tree. In other words, it's up to the vendor that develops the third-party plugin to make sure that they test it and va validate it uh, to the nth degree. And then Neutron will just take some of the core shims which are required to interface with these third-party, whether it's ML2 plugins and protection, the future service plugins as well. So what all of that means is that over time, it's going to become even more important whether it's end customers who are deploying OpenStack or whether it's uh, distribution vendors that have to uh, enable OpenStack to work well for these end customers and ensure a good experience, to make sure that this all comes together at some point before it gets deployed. And what gets deployed is something that A, works, B, works consistently, not just a one-off thing, right? It just can't happen now and then three months down the road if you do a deployment again, well, guess what? Trunk has changed, right? So there's an le element of how do you make this work? How do you make it work consistently? And how do you make it work at scale? Well, so, let me pause there for a second, and I want you guys to think about this for a bit. Think about OpenStack today, and think about, think about the pace of change with just the projects we have today, right? There's a number of uh, integrated projects, there's a handful of in incubated projects, right? And that's just the current model. Think about what we're going towards. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing yet, I actually think it's a good thing. I'll come back and tell you why that is. Now, if you, if you continue to proceed, most customers I talk to typically go by deployments in anywhere from a six, uh, deployments and upgrades, anywhere from a six month to a slightly longer cycle, right? Uh, there's a handful of, there's a small number of customers that have a much more aggressive continuous deployment uh, uh, mode. But generally, most enterprise customers don't do upgrades every week, right? And I'm gonna come back and talk about why we need to move further in that direction. But think about that for a second. Now, where are we going, right? In this new, in this new OpenStack model, where individual OpenStack projects could be coming out with releases whether it's monthly or every six months or every week or every day, depending on the project, right? And you have plugins that are each vendor is updating on their own, again, on their own timeline. What does it mean as, a, as someone deploying OpenStack to keep this running in production? Here I'm gonna take a, a comparison to what I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I grew up in you know, learning computers. I grew up doing computer engineering like many of you in the room, right? This is not a new problem, right? In, in, in this space, when you have a problem, generally the way computer scientists solve it is to add a level of abstraction, right? But the process that's been followed uh, in other domains to solve problems like this and I'll call out one or two examples of that. You look at what's happening in application development, right? Historically, we've had 
um, typically monolithic applications, and you had different software development paradigms ranging from his historically, you know, waterfall models to eventually moving to more agile models, eventually to really a continuous uh, integration, continuous deployment model. And in parallel to that, um, what what uh, enterprises, what people developing applications have realized is, you know, this is great, but why why if we can put a well-defined API and a well-defined level of abstraction in front of a piece of code, why does why can't we just use that uh, API and abstraction and decompose the application into smaller modules, decompose the teams into smaller teams, which has really led to the emergence of microservices, right? So today, microservices is the hottest thing ever. The whole reason for things like Docker and, uh, and other uh, similar uh, technologies is because everyone wants to move to microservices. Everyone wants to isolate uh, pieces of code into smaller modules, right? And this is, this is not a new concept. You can go back and lead, read some of the classic papers in computer science. You go back and read the Parnas paper from Carnegie Mellon in 1972. I think, or 71, right? It talks about how you decompose bigger problems into smaller problems in such a fashion that these can then be managed, uh, uh, much larger projects can be managed out of these smaller decomposed modules. So the thing to think about is in the OpenStack context, in the cloud infrastructure uh, context, it doesn't just have to be OpenStack, it could just as well apply to Open Daylight, it could apply to a number of other projects as well. Why, if you're deploying a large cloud infrastructure platform, do you need to not just install it, but update it all at once? Do you need to uh, move everything all at once? Right? So the thing to, that I'd like you to think about is, and this is something that I'm thinking about with some of the partners I work with, I'm thinking about this with some of the customers I deal with as well, is as the governance model, as the uh, code models around OpenStack evolve, are there ways to decompose OpenStack into smaller pieces? OpenStack by its nature really lends itself to this because every major project in OpenStack, major and minor project in OpenStack, typically is front-ended by well-defined API. They're well-defined, and some projects like Neutron, like Cinder, have even uh, nicer models for, for South One plugin interfaces as well, right? So the, 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 main, the, main, um, the main factor requiring uh, enterprises to go about this process of wholesale upgrades from one release to the next is because we, none of us know you know, what happens if you start mixing and matching individual pieces from different releases. That's not kind of how the community tests, generally not how vendors test today, right? But as an example, if you step back and you put yourself in the shoes of someone deploying OpenStack at scale, let's say you're deploying OpenStack at scale across three data centers, or a, a deploying a reasonable size, um, fairly large enterprise or a small, mid-sized uh, service provider cloud. And you'd, let's say you've spent a good three months, four months, figuring out how, how to do Keystone Federation with a bunch of different backend plugins for Keystone. Similarly, you've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get your uh, virtualization layer or your bare metal layer, ironic layer, is working well with the hardware platform that you have in place. And, so, and same thing with Neutron. You figured out your Neutron situation, pick your favorite Neutron plugin, works great. And suddenly, someone in the organization comes, comes to you and says, hey, I, just, I would love to have Hadoop as a service, or analytics as a, as a service. And I have this amazing new Hadoop distribution that, by the way, it, it, it works great with OpenStack, but just happens to work on, uh, what's, the, what's the M release again? I've, I've lost track. The Mitaka, is it the M release of OpenStack? Uh, yeah, I think it's Metaka. That's uh, um, 
So it, it works great, but it requires this new release of, of, uh, of um, Sahara, right? Suddenly you're going like, okay, this is a major uh, business unit and they want this, and th this, this dependency on the M release is there. So suddenly you have to go back and think about updating your entire OpenStack environment, which includes bringing in all of the other potential changes with Keystone, with Nova, with Neutron, all of it, right? Other ways, and this is something not just at the, you know, at the code level, but other ways to think about how can you preserve key elements of design choices you've already made, whether it is things like having to do with the hardware bare metal uh, parts of it, whether it's having to do with the networking parts of it. How do you preserve some of that, but at the same time trying to bring in newer capabilities, which have nothing, for example, bringing in a, a new Hadoop plugin Maybe it has nothing to do with how you do Keystone, right? Why does it, why does it have to have uh, ties? And I think uh, I, some of the conversations I've been having with some of uh, our industry partners who've been thinking along the same lines as well is A, as the OpenStack community and the OpenStack Foundation and the technical communities move towards a much more uh, a different governance model that's more encompassing and provides for the ability for greater agility and greater choices. At this, in that same vein, as vendors, we also need to start thinking about moving away from monolithic solutions that put together everything into a single, uh, into a single solution and s sell it as a monolith. And deployers of OpenStack who also deploy and upgrade OpenStack as monolithic entities, right? And move towards A, a more agile mechanism, whether it's continuous deployment remains to be seen. There's a uh, tooling that's starting to happen that's uh, enabling that to a greater degree these days. I mean, upstream in OpenStack, a lot of the, uh, the, pro the infrastructure tooling already does that today, so that's certainly possible, right? Uh, moving that into production at scale, few challenges there, but even, though, even in those cases, tooling is starting to happen. And similarly, also think about not just providing, not just moving towards a more continuous deployment mechanism, but also how do you decompose the monolithic entity that is OpenStack? Even though if you just lift up the covers, the individual projects are already nicely decomposed for you. Right? And how, how, how can we start thinking along those lines? And that's something to think about. So today, the key challenges that I see with package solution, or engineered solutions like a FlexPod, like a, you know, a, many of the reference architectures that we have, is it takes time to pull together all of the different components from the hardware components to the use cases, to the solution components, to the management tools, test it, validate it, and say, hey, here's a recipe for installing all of these on a given engineered solution. And guess what? By the way, it, it, in the two or three months that it takes to develop that solution, test it on the release bits, guess what? The release bits have moved on a couple of versions on, right? So, and that's, by the way, it's not a bad thing. A lot of enterprise customers that we deal with, uh, part of the reason they get value from companies like Red Hat is the life cycle. We don't just, you know, when we ship a release of OpenStack, we don't just ship a given release and then you know three months later say hey you have to upgrade we have an extended life cycle right so it's about the support and the life cycle that we bring to the table but yes there are always going to be enterprises that would live in that old in that in that style of thinking but there's a, we are working with the leading edge of enterprises looking at that's great but I want something that's more flexible that's more Really, I call it micro-infrastructure. If you guys have a better word for that, I would love to hear that, but that's something to think about. Right? So that's the uh, thought, thought uh, the idea I want to leave with you. Give it some thought. Uh, let's work on it as a community. Any comments or questions? The number of folks here from the OpenStack community, I'd invite any comments from you guys as well. Any more questions? Great. And to just wrap up in conclusion, when you guys are going about deploying solutions like engineered solutions like 
flex part. Absolutely, these are things we've tested. But like I said, trust but verify. You know, the upstream community moves on. The bits continue to update on an ongoing basis. Um, when you're deploying solutions, don't start by customizing it. Start by getting something that works. Make sure you understand it, and then customize. Think about, think about how you can decompose solutions into smaller, manageable pieces. And uh, the, this is the only real plug I'll leave you from a Red Hat perspective. I have tried to make this somewhat uh, product, not product-centric. But the value that a company like Red Hat brings is the ecosystem. Right? In, in, in our case, we have the benefit of having the ability to build on top of a really mature robust set of ecosystem partnerships and relationships and engineering processes that we uh, leverage from the Red Hat Enterprise Linux environment. This is something that we built up over the last uh, literally 12, 14 years. And having, having been in different roles across the industry, having done things like start the open source and Linux organization at HP from the office of the CTO, I can tell you that the amount of engineering that it takes to do and the hard work that it takes to build up a, a stable base platform is so often understated in the industry. But it, is, it, is, it makes a huge difference when it comes to uh, moving things into production, especially at scale. Right? So that's the one real plug I'll leave you from a Red Hat perspective. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'd be around for a couple of hours longer. Would love to chat with some of you, in fact, all of you. Thank you.